Uh, my name is Farzad Rashidi. I'm one of the co-founders and lead innovator at Ruspana, which is an all-in-one link building outreach software that helps businesses increase organic traffic from Google. Um, reason why I came on and, and was asked by Kieran to join uh, here today is uh, mainly because of my background over at our parent company, which is called BizMe, uh, which we grew to over, I would say, close to about 3 million in organic traffic. And we're, we're a team of about 100 people now. But at the time, we started as a bootstrap company, very limited resources, very small business. Uh, so the yeah, goal of the call, just to give you guys the agenda, is for me to first start with some of the basic stuff. So in terms of understanding how we need to build the right site structure, uh, move on to exactly uh, walking through the process of figuring out how to pick the right keywords, how to write content. And once we have those stuff down, then we're going to talk about, okay, now that we have the right website, how are we going to get some eyeballs on it, right? So we're going to chat a little bit about promotion tactics and link building and what I'm you using respond for some of those examples, uh, but I'm also going to offer some alternative ways in terms of how you guys will be able to do most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today uh, pretty manually. Now, no need uh, for a whole lot of fancy tools. You can, If you're just getting started, I actually recommend against paying for a whole lot of tools. Uh, just maybe start doing things manually and, and kind of over time can utilize some of these software to help you to save time. Uh, well, I had a lot of uh, uh, jokes uh, that I had prepared, uh, Irish Irish jokes, uh, but I'm going to skip some of those. <laughs> so I was asked by Karen to go ahead and move on with the day so you guys can get on with your day. Don't mean to take too much of your time here, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but perfect. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So uh, Karen, if you do me a favor and just confirm you guys can see my screen yes. okay? Perfect. Awesome, 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 perfect. Well, uh, guys, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Respana is a link building outreach software. We started at, uh, as an internal software at a parent company called Visme, uh, which uh, for folks who haven't heard of us, ouch, <laughs> that hurts my feelings just a little bit. Uh, but we're an all-in-one uh, branded content creation platform. So if you're a business looking to create any sort of visual uh, visuals like presentations, reports, proposals, um, um, based on brand guidelines. That's the tool to use. It's free to get started. So definitely go check it out. But when we started, when I joined uh, Visme, I was the first marketing hire and they had built a really good product, but we didn't really have um, a go-to market strategy. So didn't have a consistent flow of customers coming to us. So I was tasked with figuring out, figuring that out, which uh, they said, good luck, <laughs> go sell this thing now. So what we basically decided to do was to experiment with a few different strategies. Obviously, paid advertising is getting more expensive by the day, and there's diminishing ROI. It wasn't a very scalable channel for us, especially as a bootstrap company. Uh, we also experimented with cold outreach, but our platform, Visme, is very affordable. I think our subscription started like $15 a month. So it wasn't really a type of product that you go door-to-door -to, -door, uh, door -to, -door to sell because it doesn't make economic sense. So we landed on SEO which basically we knew from day one that our customers were already looking for a product or a solution like ours, right? So if you are looking to create a presentation or infographic, normally if you don't already have a solution, the first thing you do is that you pull up Google and go, uh, you know, for example, Google a term like presentation software. And can you guys actually do this with me? Because I'm not sure actually what pops up on the Irish uh, uh, version of Google, but uh, normally we should be somewhere at the top here. There we go. So normally when you guys Google something, it, it tells you however many search results pops up. Uh, this is not cooperating with me today, but uh, normally it tells me, okay, here's how many search results or here's how many web pages that contain the keyboard presentation software, for example. And, uh, and the number last time I checked was three and a half billion. <laughs> so out of three and a half billion search results, uh, we had to get ourselves in the top three or top 10 at a minimum to, because that's where 99% of the clicks are going to go. So the process for us to kind of get ourselves up in the search results, we started to, at the beginning, building a bunch of content pieces. Uh, didn't really work out the way we wanted because it was completely crickets, as I'm sure some of you guys are experiencing that right now, <laughs> that you maybe have invested in an SEO company or or an, a writing team and, and they are putting together content and, uh, and then 
you get absolutely nobody coming to your website through Google, which is exactly what we experimented with. So what we found out over trial and error over the years uh, was a very scientific process, step by step, uh, that I actually outlined in a little ebook that I put together. And it's for free. You guys can go download it. I, I'm going to be uh, walking you guys through a couple of examples. But if you guys want a more comprehensive I would say, guys, so you can take it home with you. Just go ahead and Google Visme marketing strategy and, and should be at the top of the search results here. So there we go. Very uh, marketing strategies. We used to bootstrap Visme. Uh, right now, we're at about 14 million out of 10 million since we published this book. Uh, but you could go ahead and click download for free and uh, you could go ahead and grab that resource for you. Uh, and, and that's something that I'm going to use quite a lot during this presentation. But without any further ado, guys, I'm going to go ahead and actually walk you guys through the entire process. So I'm going to imagine Vesme as a new website that we just put together and we have no content pieces. All we got is a homepage. And I want to get ourselves from zero to our first 100K in monthly organic traffic. And by the way, that's where Responder just hit. And that was a milestone for us. We hit 100K in monthly organic traffic from Google. So let's see how we're going to do this thing. All right, let's stop talking. Let's start actually walking you guys through the process. So step one, when it comes to building a website, comes down to, okay, what pages do we need to create? Building the right site structure. So for that, I'm going to use a software called uh, uh, Ahrefs, uh, which I highly recommend if you guys are serious about SEO. It is hard to kind of get around it um, uh, without needing to use some of this functionality. Uh, but there are some, uh, I would say, more affordable alternatives called Uber Suggest, for example, that you can use. That does some of the, uh, that does, I would say, 80% of what Ahrefs does. So um, if you guys are more cost conscious, I would start with that probably. But Ahrefs is normally our go to software or SEMrush. That's also a good alternative. And uh, that uh, I'm going to use throughout the presentation when it comes to keyword research. So as far as how we're going to do this is basically uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with a process that we developed at, at um, uh, Vesme, which we call finding what we call opportunity keywords. So a lot of people who are listening, they're like, okay, Farzad, I know we're going to get, I want to get organic traffic, but a lot of the search, uh, I would say results for our target keywords are dominated by the big guys. And uh, it's very difficult to try to stay and remain competitive when you're a new small business, right? Uh, so what we want to do is to first understand, okay, let's buy as much as we can chew. So let's try to figure out what are these opportunity keywords, which is a combination of three metrics. Because there's always an, 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 an very large number of uh, keywords that you guys could go and target. But we need to find a process that we could prioritize them based on a higher number of volume, but that's only one side of the coin. Want to make sure that it's within reach, so it's low competitiveness, and at the same time, high in commercial value. Because it's hard, it's easy to find keywords that get a lot of volume, but they're not competitive. But at the same time, they don't have nothing to do with your business. So you want to have all three pillars together to for you, and that that overlapping um, a number of keywords that remain. So keywords that get a good amount of volume low competition, and high in commercial intent. And that's what we call opportunity keywords. So let's go and figure out how exactly we're going to be able to find these opportunity keywords. So that starts with a tool called Ahrefs. If you guys are already using SEMrush, other tools, process remains the same. So what one thing I like to do is to look up a keyword that's a parent keyword for Visme. So for example, Visme is an infographic presentation tool. So I can, if you look up that keyword infographic, uh, you see it gets quite a lot of volume. But the problem here is that it's extremely difficult to try to rank for it. And it's dominated by some of the big guys in the industry, right? So let's see uh, how we're going to be. Oh, actually, apparently, uh, this means ranking here <laughs> number six. Okay, well, we're going to learn how we're going to hopefully help ourselves get up in the top three. But basically, when you look at this, it looks daunting. So one thing that we start with during our research process is to actually go through a menu called search suggestions. So any keyword research software you guys use is going to give you a gazillion different variations of different keywords uh, that are um, basically being searched because nobody really looking up the keyword uh, or I would say it, it's almost unrealistic for any website to try to rank for the parent keyword infographic from the get-go, maybe seven, eight years from now, 
Uh, but but there's a ton of different search recommendations that these tools give you that contain that keyword. So for example, infographic creator or infographic poster is a much easier uh, to obtain keyword, but with a decent amount of volume. But we got to have to figure out a way and how we're going to be able to actually prioritize this. So first thing I do is I use it. I use three metrics here that these tools give me. I know it looks daunting and complicated, but at the end of the day, these are very simple guys. So I'm going to use three metrics here. So as far as uh, competitive, excuse me, as far as the volume goes, I like to use a metric called uh, instead of volume, I like to use the traffic potential because uh, traffic potential. So if you take a look at the keyword here, is the amount of traffic that the top uh, the first search results for that keyword get. So even though about half a million people search for this keyword, um, then but the number of people who actually uh, click on the first search results and come in is about 7.6 guess. It's a much more realistic metric to use as a measure of volume. And another metric I use for uh, uh, basically competitiveness to put it objectively, is, is a um, metric called keyword difficulty, or KD, which basically is a metric from zero to 100 that tells you how difficult it is to rank for a keyword. And last one, at least, is uh, commercial intent. So we need to define what a commercial intent is. And the, the best metric I've found for it is actually the cost per click of that keyword for AdWords, which is Google Ads. Now, you may be saying, OK, Farzo, we're talking about SEO here. Where, where are you uh, incorporating CPC here? The reason why is because advertisers like to make money. So if somebody's willing to bet $12 on this keyword, it means they're making money out of this keyword. Otherwise, they wouldn't be spending this much. But so what this tells me is that if an advertiser is willing to pay $12 for one click for infographic design, this is a lot more valuable keyword than infographic show, that's almost NA, or infographic definition, which is only about a dollar, right? So we want to prioritize keywords to rank organically for that have a higher cost per click. So you can extract these keyword suggestions out of Ahrefs or whatever other tool that you guys are using, and I'll pop it into this formula that I call the opportunity score. I used to, oh, I'm sorry, guys. I, I'm getting a note here that this is very hard to follow for someone who's not techie. And so uh, I'm gonna do my best to keep it a little simpler. Don't jump a whole lot among screens, but also we're gonna share the recording of this call with you guys so that you can easy, easily rewatch and follow. I know I'm dumping a lot of information here, uh, but uh, we only have about 30 to 40 minutes. I'm gonna do my best to condense as much information as I can. And you guys are going to receive the replay so you can share that with your team and maybe rewatch. So, so we got a bunch, a few hundreds of keywords here. And for us to have a metric for us to be able to uh, prioritize this out of, I developed this little score called the opportunity score. We used to call this the Farzad score. And <laughs> our team was like, Farzad, that's uh, too tacky. So we landed on opportunity score. So this is a score that basically helps us based on these metrics that I just discussed. So the amount of keyword difficulty, the amount of cost per click and traffic potential, which again, goes back to prioritizing these keywords is a simple formula that basically says, okay, multiply the number of one over keyword difficulty because the higher the keyword difficulty, uh, right, the worse it is for us. So we want to make it one over, multiply by the number of clicks or the number of traffic potential for that, for that keyword, multiply by the number of cost per click. And once you put that in a little spreadsheet here, it's going to give you a score that doesn't mean anything on its own. But when you sort based on that keyword, it's going to give you a prioritized list of keywords to go after. All right. So these are keywords, parent keywords that give you the best, uh, I would say, value for the amount of resources you have. So it gives you highest commercial intent, highest volume and lowest competition possible. Now, one thing I skipped here is that if you guys are just getting started, we want to make sure that we only target keywords that basically, okay, I'm going to stop uh, going through different screens. I'm, I'm trying to uh, figure out where I am here. There we go. Uh, one thing I skipped here is that I normally like to put a max keyword difficulty as the domain rating of your website, which is basically is a fancy way of saying, don't reach for the stars when it comes to SEO. Okay. So if you're just getting started and your uh, domain rating, for example, which is a metric here is low, it means you don't have a whole lot of backlinks to your website yet. Your website isn't very authoritative yet. Do not put a keyword difficulty that exceeds that number. So right now, the domain rating of Vizme is 84. And that means that we can go um, 
and, and target keywords that have higher competition. So uh, I'm going to put the max as the dom as a rule of thumb. Again, it's not very scientific, but as it's a very good rule of thumb, is that not target keywords that have a domain rating of more than what we can chew, right? So that's normally gives you a better list to start. But anyways, so let's say, guys, we go ahead and go down the list and we pick a keyword that we would like to target. So in this case, what we find is the keyword is infographic design, which is a keyword that basically um, um, and we would like to go and write. And what the next step is understanding user intent. So once we know, okay, infographic design is the target keyword, I want to make sure what type of uh, search and search uh, results come up for this keyword. So once you ignore all the ads, go straight to the search organic results. And you see here, the top organic results normally are talking about an ultimate infographic design guide. They're talking about an ultimate guide, how to create an infographic. And this tells me that I would potentially need to go and create a, uh, after analyzing the top 10 search results, a, a blog post that caters to this keyword. However, if you take another keyword, for example, infographic maker, the user intent for that is going to be uh, a sales page, right? So if you take a look at, for example, Vizme's or Canva's, you see these are sales pages. These are not blog articles, they're actually um, um, product pages. So you want to run that through an incognito tab. The reason why we use incognito is because you don't want your existing search history to impact um, the results of Google because Google personalizes the results. Um, and, and understand, okay, what do we need to create in the first place? And it happens so that for the keyword infographic design, we would like to create an ultimate guide of infographic design. So we jump straight to that result and bam, we got a blog post, infographic design. All right, so for the sake of time, <laughs> we didn't go and create that post as we speak during this call. We had already published this, uh, I would say, a, a year ago or so. So we already have a comprehensive article that explains exactly how to create an infographic. And, ex and, and you know, it's comprehensive, it's of good quality, it, and, and basically, you don't want to stuff keywords here. You want to keep that content pretty educational. But the problem is going to be once we publish this blog post is that it's going to be crickets. <laughs> uh, it's going to be extremely difficult for us to now try to get that up in the search results without actually having a, a good amount of backlinks pointed to our website. So that's where Respondent comes into play, because the way Google and these searches, uh, search engines work. So if you go and Google, for example, infographic design again, let's see how many search results pop up. 533 million. So you're going against 533 million other web pages that are also talking about infographic design, which is mind boggling. <laughs> so let's say you say to me, Farzad, I hire the best writers and we create the best content and I'm in the top 1% of in terms of quality of content. You're still going to be in the thousands, right? When it comes to, or actually in this case, millions, <laughs> about 5 million search results. So even if you're in the top 1%, you're still going to be in the millions. So how are we going to get ourselves in the top 10, which get over 99% of clicks? So the way Google prioritizes these search engines is not only just relying on on-page stuff, which basically says how, what, what content, how good is your content on your website. But he also looks at how other websites are talking about your content, okay? So if other relevant authoritative websites in your space are also talking about your website and linking back to your website, then it's a vote of popularity in the eyes of Google. So that's easier said than done though, right? Because if you guys think that was complicated, that's all the stuff that's under your control, right? You can just go follow the process step by step, watch the replay, and you can go get a prioritized list of keywords, go down the list, create a content piece for each one of these keywords, right? Completely under your control. You can reverse engineer that any day. But what's very difficult to compete is how we're going to actually go now get other people, convince other people to link back to our website. So let's go through an example here. So for this purpose, I'm going to use Respond, which is an internal tool we use ourselves. But again, if you guys are just getting started, I actually advise against you guys to go and straight up go pay for Respond. Don't do it. I mean, it's $99 a month, not going to break the bank. But 
I would recommend you guys to go and do it manually because you want to keep the investment to a minimum and also wants to do things manually. You kind of get to know the process and understand the pain points a lot more. So then that, that side, and then once you hit a point there, you're like, okay, now I'm ready to scale. <clears throat> then a tool like Respondent com, uh, comes in to save you a ton of time. Okay. All right. So as we go through the campaign flow, I'm going to, I'm going to walk you guys through how you'd be able to do the same things, but manually yourself. So first thing we do, I'm going to go ahead and create a campaign and respond. I'm going to call this campaign infographic design because that is the target keyword of the page that we are trying to build backlinks for. And I'm going to, so there's four steps in a back, uh, uh, process for any sort of link building campaign. Step one is to find the right websites to reach out to. Second step is to go ahead and build an email template. Third step is to let Respondo go find the right contacts for us. And the last step is to preview and personalize. Okay, so that was a lot of things. Let's go through an example. So once we publish this content called infographic design, let me actually bring this over here on this browser so that we don't have to keep going back and forth. Okay, so once we publish this post on infographic design, one of the first things we can do is to understand what are some of the other content pieces published on the web that have mentioned the keyword infographic design somewhere in the body. But if you just go and Google infographic design, it's just going to bring up comp competing articles that are talking about the same things, right? So what we want to do is to ideally find non-competing pieces of articles that happen to mention infographic design somewhere in the body, but it shouldn't contain that keyword in the title. So that implies that the target keyword is something else, right? So for example, um, they're talking about, hey, what are some of the, um, I would say, marketing trends for 2022? And they're talking about, oh, one of the things that you could do to stand out in 2022 is to create an infographic or, or, or create design an infographic or a blog post, et cetera. So that is a perfect anchor for our comprehensive guide because then we can reach out to whoever is the right person for that editor and incentivize these guys to work with us. So we can say, hey, John, or hey, Kieran, just uh, came across your... Uh, post on marketing trends. And that, let's actually go through a Google search here so I can show you guys how you can uh, find those. So for this matter, I'm going to use what we call Google Advanced Operator. So we have a list of them here in Respana. You guys can Google that yourself. So if you don't have access to Respana, you could go ahead and basically building this query inside Google for free. So first thing I'm going to use is the, uh, is the word in URL. So it's a command that helps us get our searches more granular. So I can tell Google, hey, find all the blog posts so in their URL that have the word blog that are in their text that mention our target keyword, which in this case is infographic design. Okay, so I'm going to put that in quotation mark. That not in their title, they mention infographic. So what I'm trying to find or infographics, let me actually add that in here because apparently doesn't. All right, perfect. So there you go. So they're talking about helpful resources for creating beautiful infographics or three ways to use infographics on your website. So they're not necessarily talking about infographic design, but they happen to mention infographic design somewhere in the body, right? So let me actually go ahead, infographic design. All right, there we go. So here I have the target keyword infographic design, but the overall topic here is how to use infographics on your website. So they're not necessarily talking about, um, hey, how, yes, this is a different ways you can use infographics, but how do you actually go about designing it? So our content makes a perfect set, makes a perfect fit here for this blog post. So it's our job to find whoever Aaron is, if there's a writer on the page, or if not someone who's in charge of editorial and incentivize these guys to actually uh, and, and the way you can incentivize them is through different ways. You can offer them, hey, hey, come across a blog post. Hey, Aaron, come across a blog post about how to uh, use infographics on your blog. And notice you guys mentioned infographic design here, but didn't really actually um, um, link to a, a comprehensive resource that explains to people how they can design these graphics on their own. And we put together a comprehensive guide that I think would make a nice fit. And if you were kind to give us a mention here, I'm more than happy to do X, Y, and Z for you. For example, I'm more than happy to share this with my newsletter of uh, 5,000 people that are in the infographic space. So you can hire you guys if they want to do it on their own. Or I'm happy to give you 
if you have free product you can offer them, I'm happy to give you a Visme account on the house for three months. Uh, or, hey, I'm writing an article for another blog and I would love to reference your article as a thank you. So what I'm trying to say is that there are different ways on how you be able to incentivize them. But step one is finding out, okay, who these websites are. So using Respana, we can actually go ahead and find these queries. So you can, you can drop it into Respana. And then you can add metrics here uh, to, for Respond to go scrape the Google results and, and pick those right websites for you. But again, you don't have to use it. You can go ahead and use just good old fashioned Google and actually grab these search results yourself, put them in the spreadsheet and go through and manually reach out to each one of these websites. Now, another thing I'd like to say, which is a somewhat of an easier strategy is actually what we call the competitor backlink strategy. So for example, one of the one of the things we can do is that we can run that keyword through Google, see who's already ranking for that keyword, right? So in this case, there's a Vingage article, which is a competitor to Visme. So I can pop this right inside Respana and Respana would automatically go and find, so there we go, Canva, all right, and Vingage. So we got a bunch of them here. So Respana would automatically go and find the backlinks that each one of these blog posts have. So Obviously, these blog posts are up in the search results because they have a comprehensive backlink profile. That's one of the metrics. So one of the first things we can do is also to go and reverse engineer and see where they're getting their links from and reach out to them and actually ask for additional replacement in exchange for an incentive. So you can go ahead and tell Responder, hey, go find me all the backlinks that these guys have and go ahead and basically um, filter them through and then base find me a list of websites that backlink to these um, competing articles. And that's what we call the competitor backlink strategy. Now, if the stuff that I'm telling you guys is complicated, we do have an outreach strategy hub on the Respana website. So if you navigate to Respana at the, at the end of the page right here, we have an outreach strategy hub that explains step-by-step -step different recipes and examples for different sorts of strategies. So the two strategies I used today or the anchor text strategy, which is finding out what are some of the non-competing posts that include your keywords, and the SERP competitor backlinks, which is the second strategy I mentioned about finding out who's linking to a competing piece of article. And you can basically go ahead and, and, and find these using Respana. Or if you already have a list, for example, if I already have a, uh, a list of articles here that I have uh, basically put together, you can, let me remove some of these web pages here. Give me one second, please. Okay, perfect. So one of the, uh, one of the things we can do also is that if you guys are using any other software uh, for finding out, like you using Uber suggest or any other tools to identify these opportunities, you can always go ahead and also import them into Respana, which is uh, another thing we can do here. But at the end of the day, guys, what we're going to end up with and step one, whether you're doing it manually or using Respond, is going to be a bunch of URLs. So it's just, just a bunch of articles that we want to reach out to and incentivize to work with them, to partner with them in order to get a, get a backlink. Now, that leads us to the second step, which is, which is to build our pitch. So depending on the strategy, we want to have the right pitch. Now, if you guys are using the Outreach Strategy Hub, we give you guys the right template to use. So I can actually, if you scroll down at the bottom, uh, we give you a, uh, a template that you guys can use. In this case, what I'm trying to do is I'm using the um, um, uh, anchor text strategy. So I'm saying, hi, I'm Vlad, Outreach Manager Respana. You know, we came across your article on uh, whatever the article title is. It can sprinkle in some variables here. And notice that you guys talked about micro influencers. In this case, it would be infographic design. And I noticed that, you know, we just released our own guide. And if you were kind to give us a mention, more than happy to do X, Y, and Z for you. Okay. And you guys can also build a follow up email. And that's something that is highly recommended. About 65% of our uh, uh, responses actually come after the first follow up. It's very important to include a follow up here. But again, if you're sending emails manually, you want to make sure you snooze those emails and follow up with them after a week or so, because that's, that's where the money lies, all right? Now, guys, if you take a step back here, we haven't really done anything of significance yet. So I just basically Googled some stuff, found some websites, built an email template. Now the problem becomes how we're gonna actually find the right person. So let's say if you come across this blog post and you wanna reach out to the right person, how would you go about doing that, okay? So one of the, 
processes that our team used to use was to start from the writer. So I can, we have the writer here on the page, Erica. So I can see if Erica works at the company currently, because if she currently works at Sirius Insight, then great. You can reach out to her directly because she obviously has access to the blog. So she can actually collaborate. She's in a position to be able to collaborate with us. But 75% of cases, there's either no writer on the page or the writer doesn't work there. Then what do we do? Right? So we would need to go on normally before responding, we'd have to go on LinkedIn, find some sort of content manager or someone relevant in the marketing team, and then find their email address somehow or message them on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, we know if you had found their email addresses, you want to put them on a, on a spreadsheet, export, put it into an email average tool or manually email each one. Very time consuming. <laughs> so you don't have to do any of that stuff. You can basically just tell a responder, hey, go find a writer, but only if they work there. Otherwise, go find one or two people at the company who match this position of seniority. So anybody with the words like partnerships, SEO, marketing, et cetera, and their job title. And that's it. <laughs> and then all you got to do is just to go ahead and click find contacts and you suddenly you forget it. So it basically goes through every single one of these articles, finds the right people for you, gets the emails, verifies the emails, everything is handled by us. So once you let the automation run to completion, you're going to end up with a screen like this, where every single one of these articles now are going to have their own pre-assigned contact info. So do you guys remember Erica from Sirius Insight? So apparently she does, in fact, work at the company. So respond to and find the contact info. Or this is an article by Vizme. Yay. <laughs> and it's written by, let's see who it's written by, Orana. And she's actually a, a freelancer for us. She doesn't actually work at our company. So... We basically went ahead and, and, and responded, went ahead and found the content marketing manager at Bisbee Matter and got the content. All of that stuff is, uh, uh, is managed by us. And if you didn't like the person it found for you, you can just say, hey, give me all the marketing people at this domain, at this company. And then it will pull up all their company employee data so you can make sure if you want to make any adjustments or replace that person with somebody else. You can do that. You can do that within the manual flow, but normally the automation takes care of all that work for you, so you don't actually have to take care. Of, you don't have to touch it manually. Just let it let it do its thing. And the last step of the campaign is deep personalization, which is highly recommended. So at this point, Respondent puts together all the pitches, right? So all of our variables automatically pre-filled for each one of the websites that we are reaching out to, and you can maybe send a test email to yourself, make sure everything looks good to go. But here's a few tips if you're reaching out to some bigger websites, all right? So first of all, if you're just starting out with a small website, I don't recommend you to go straight up reach out to the big guys in the industry, like HubSpot, right? Don't reach out to the big websites just yet. When I set those respondent filters to like domain rating of with, within 10 to 20 plus within your domain rating, so you're playing within your league. But if you once you are kind of increasing your domain rating and you're like, okay, I can actually reach out to some uh, better opportunities here. Uh, you can, you want to make sure that you you go above and beyond these variables and add an extra level of personalization to your templates. So here's a few ideas. So for example, I'm talking about, hey, I finished going through an article on how to make an infographic, but the article title here is too long. So I can go ahead and make that shorter a little, right? I don't need to mention the whole article title here. Plus, uh, Respondent gives you some snippets from the article, so article summary snippets that I can use to personalize the pitch. So I could say something like, oh, I loved your tip on not using a template would make your infographic one of a kind, right? Uh, or if you're doing this manually, you can actually read through the article, mention something interesting that I've actually talked about in an article. And plus, what I would recommend is to also have a LinkedIn connection request sent out. So I would recommend you to guys uh, to send them a connection request just so that they sort of see your face read your name, know that you're a real person, not another email spammer, right? They're getting in their inbox. So having that multi-touch approach, so you're emailing them and also, um, uh, I would say, engaging with them on other social channels goes a long way in getting better replies. And then you can, if you're doing this manually, you just click send and want to make sure it's news to follow up. If you're using Respondent, all that actions are completely automated. So you click verify and launch and you start sending emails from your email account and you can view all the open rates, deliver rates, reply rates. And you can basically manage all the replies within response. If you're using multiple different email accounts, it brings in uh, all of the uh, emails under one roof. So, you can, so it's a fully collaborative inbox. It can manage replies within response as well, or if not, you can do that within your own account. But that's pretty much it, guys, as far as the entire outreach process. 
at, for a specific blog post. There is a ton of different ways you guys can do it. Some strategies are actually simpler, right? So for example, they have a help for reporter strategy. There is a bunch of different ones here that are sometimes even simpler than the ones that I, uh, that I uh, went through. Um, uh, if this sounds like something that you guys don't either have the resources for in-house or you don't want to do it, <laughs> uh, which is understandable. Uh, we have a Respondent Guru Hub, a list of uh, pre-vetted uh, freelancers and agencies that basically uh, run average campaigns through your email account for you. So you can contact some of these guys. Emmett is a great guy. He's actually based out of Scotland. So he's pretty close to you guys. I recommend you guys to reach out to him. His pricing and stuff is um, here. We don't actually have any financial affiliation with these guys. So we don't get a commission because we want to keep these pretty uh, consistent. So these guys aren't cheap, uh, but they at least put you guys in the right direction. So you can start a responder account add them to your account to run average campaigns for you. So you kind of get a sense of, okay, here's what's working. Here's what, what's not. Not over a certain period of time, like after three months, you can, you can delegate that to a junior staff member within the company to kind of take care of that stuff for you so, so you can save some cost this way. So that would be another recommendation. Uh, if this stuff that I'm telling you guys sounds overwhelming, you can definitely get some help from some uh, experts uh, that we pre-vetted. And um, and basically kind of bring that process in-house once you have established process. But now you can, you can kind of gain visibility in terms of what, what exactly these guys are doing within your, within your account. And I would like to pause here, guys, and jump, jump straight into your questions. I know we've been covering quite a lot. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to make sure that um, uh, you know, we, we, we answer everything, cover everything. So Kieran. How's it I going? have a few questions here, Noel. Again, if anyone else has any questions, please do um, shoot them in for sure. So yeah, you've kind of uh, pulled back the curtain, and now we all know how we're getting so many emails uh, asking for links to, to the website. So I think everyone, everyone now knows. So I, I guess the first question is how how so obviously the the, the basically the secret you, you've built a site to three million visits. Sorry, four even more. More than three million visits a month. We're we're a little north of three million. Yeah, yes, That's amazing. So again, um, so the secret to doing that is good content. So keyword research, writing content that is, um, within our level. So not going for a hundred thousand, uh, search a month keyword, but going for something that maybe is five hundred searches. Um, writing the best content we can on that page, and then you're suggesting that we should do um link reach out. So how, how important in the scale of getting traffic is link building and um, like how, how important is it? That is a great question. So it all comes down to allocation of resources because every company has a different set of resources. For example, Respondent is a much smaller team than the Visme guys. So they have nominally a lot more resources for it comes to link building than we do. However, what, what's important, the sweet spot where we found okay, here's what's the recipe for our content pieces to actually get up in the search results is by delegating 20% of your resources on content creation and the other 80% in content promotional link building. Wow. Let me repeat that again. Yeah. 20% in content creation, 80% in content promotion. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, hey, I'm a one-man show or we're a small team. We don't have the resources for it. Stop producing so much content. <laughs> Just produce one really good piece of content once a month, right? Go down that list, find a keyword, write one really good piece, spend the remainder of that month on promotion and link building, rinse and repeat. It's a lot better than just pumping out content that nobody's going to read. Wow, amazing. And and again, a lot of businesses um, might be small, like small businesses. So is it a case of reaching out? You mentioned don't go for the big hub spots, but reaching out to other small businesses or local businesses. That's right. And, and building the relationship and getting a link back from them. Maybe that's easier than hitting the big sites. Exactly. So it's, it's all uh, a matter of staying within your league. So that is applicable when it comes. SEO is not a game to shoot for the stars. All right. This is not a place to be unrealistic. Uh, we need to be very calculated in terms of, okay, going after keywords that we actually have a chance to rank for. Now that we have that, 
now let's not let's reach out to websites that we can actually provide value because link building is a game of building relationships. You can't just reach out to HubSpot because the stuff that you have to value, the, the stuff that you have of value they can offer them is normally less than what they can offer you. So you want to make sure you keep that exchange fair and simple so that when you reach out to uh, you know companies of similar sizes, you can now collaborate with them. They actually value a link from you or or uh, that your free product or whatever that, that it is you're offering them. So it starts as a collaboration, kind of nurtures that relationship. And then as your domain rating goes up, now, Vizme, we are collaborating with HubSpot. <laughs> it took us eight years to get here. So it's take a step-by-step step making sure that you you within that right, stay within that range. Incredible. And you, you mentioned offer. So would you you'd make an offer? So a scene in, in the example you had, you were suggesting that you'd share their article on social media. And Absolutely. Should you, should you always offer something? So absolutely. So that's something that I highly recommend. So normally there's three steps when it comes to link building. I didn't want to get too overcomplicated here, but we normally start at a transactional uh, collaboration. So, you know, basically, because Karen, you and I don't don't know each other. Let's imagine. I want to reach out to you. I've got to have something of value that I can offer you. So like, hey, you do this for me. I do this for you. That is a foot in the door. Now, once that's done, then what you want to do is to go and now forward that and, and um, nurture that relationship into a guest post. Like, hey, by the way, notice that, you know, a couple of your competitors are ranking for this keyword and you guys aren't. And I'd love to contribute an article to your website. And, and then it nurtures that into a relationship at, down the line where you're like, OK, hey, I publish this guest post quite often. Are you doing the same? If so, let's partner up together. So I reference your articles wherever that would make sense in my guest articles and you do the same for me. So that three-step process, we actually um, uh, have that in our link building cheat sheet. So you guys you know, can uh, download that for free. So if you navigate to any respond on a blog article um, and that I with the template and kind of step-by-step instructions of what I talk about. So for example, if I go on to any of these articles, uh, we have a CTA here that you guys can download this cheat sheet. So you can basically download it for free. So I kind of go step by step through the process of that three step process, as I mentioned, when it comes to link building, which is basically transactional link exchange. Um, and then you kind of go into a guest post and kind of go down from there. Brilliant. Excellent. So something to read. Again, I come to the end of my, my questions, I guess. Uh, so just to, um, you'd mentioned uh, one article a month. So that sounds like, uh, manageable uh, should that article be small big is there a guide on that right so that size of the article isn't quite as important as it is the um, uh, comp- comprehensiveness of the article so um, that's all dependent on user intent so google's already telling you what's working so open a new incognito run that keyword see the average or the type of information that these kinds of pieces are covering Normally, though, normally, again, I don't want to say an advocate for um, just junk content that you just go ramble, right? So normally what we've seen is that longer pieces of content are normally tend to be more comprehensive and they tend to outrank some of the smaller ones. So you want to take a look at the competing pieces, see what you're up against, and then go and, and compete with those guys and see, okay, how can we actually create something that's better? Amazing. And my last question, I guess, for me, and this analysis, and analysis, do you, do you think many companies do link building, or is it do you, my my gut, my hunch is that most don't bother because, as you yeah. say, it, it feels like there's a bit of work in it. <laughs> most don't, and the reason why they don't is because it's awkward. It's not fun. It's something that uh, when when you create content and you focus on your on-page metrics, stuff that you have direct control over. But link building is not collaborating with other people. And most people don't want to talk to other people. Uh, so now that opens up a lot of opportunity for you guys who are listening that now know what to do to go and outrank every single one of them. And that's how we did it over at Visme as a bootstrap small company that now we outrank a lot of the big guys in the industry. <laughs>